that we learn from each other, and uh, I have a joke. Gosh, this is going to be a new YouTube movie. Uh, but the idea that um, if the pay of teachers was uh, to be only as deliverers of ideas to other people, uh, somehow teaching wouldn't really ever occur. That there's such a reciprocal relationship, and in the process of teaching, we learn so much. And in the process of helping people do research, we learn so much. And I've been telling people recently not to run the risk, but I'm going to do it. I'm mentioning Ellen Glasser, who's behind the uh, video back there, that I'm finally am starting to understand feminist standpoint theory, and that's because of Ellen. But I go into uh, learning communities uh, with um, Sean Brayton, and those are the most recent. And then literacy within the college environment with Susan Slavitz and so forth. The point being that I have learned so much in working with students. And even the questions that are troubling, really, perhaps those even more, allow me to reflect later and figure something out. But the uh, idea of that reciprocity and the value of relationships. My work in England, studying a school that I feel changed my whole life, uh, always said in that school the first thing that was the most important thing was relationships. And then you can get some sensible work done. But uh, it's so hard now in so many places to take the time to do the work that is necessary for relationships. So um, let me do some thank yous. See, I've got some things written down. This is an uncomfortable environment for me, but I'll try. You're distant, you're far away, and there's all this electronic stuff so you can hear me. But thanks, Chris. Where are you, Chris Milligan? You me. Uh, I hope I can live up to some of that because I'm not going to be out of the game. I just hope to change a little bit of the focus, but I'm as many people say when they do, they're involved in transitions, it's really scary to do this and then to try and reinvent. I don't care what Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot says, for those of you who remember her words, it's scary. And she talks about how important it is for people to do this kind of work as they mature. Hello to everyone here. And thank you for coming. This is a significant event. It is not my last lecture because uh, I'm going to have a crack again sometime at uh, saying some words. To, the doc, to my Jacksonville family, here they are, and uh, they are only a representation of some more people. They're so important to me. To the doctoral students, hey you guys, I'll miss the ones in here whom I will not have a chance to get to know in the classroom, but maybe in the hallways. Uh, this is our annual gathering where we support each other in our research efforts, and that I think is such a valuable thing to remember. Alums are here. Thank you for coming back. We value everything you're doing. And so keep on with the work and keep in touch, as they always say. They always do in certain ways, but some of them go far afield when we can't get together for dinner as often as we would wish. And then thank you to my colleagues. Uh, we support each other, encouraging encourage each other and challenge each other, and that's the important business. The comment of, I don't know if you need, you know, that's a little crazy, let's try working that one out. That helps. We need that help from people. And, hey, you might want to read this. And we do that in what Paul Goodman called in the mid-60s, a community of scholars. And the word again is community. So, a um, couple things I'll try to do here. An overview, a very informal overview of key uh, policies in education since the mid-60s. So here I'm reviewing the reality of 50 years of hanging around this endeavor we have. And um, I was 12 when I got started, so all's well. <laughs> what I was thinking or pondering at the time or what I was doing Professionally, I'm leaving the other stuff out. You can find out about that in some other environment. But the professional activities. And where I think we are at this moment in time and what we might be able to do about it, and hopefully enough time at the end, good, I can see the clock easily, have a reaction from you, talk about what the challenges are, and maybe give me my marching orders about what I might be able to reasonably do, especially those of you who know all of my weaknesses and limitations. So, um, where the heck is that? Where is? I'm supposed to be in charge of the clicker. So this should work. Okay, ready? Yeah. <laughs> so much for good. <laughs> 
Yeah, okay. This is going to be We'll see. Okay, so it's um, by decades, roughly, and I don't know if you can read it, but um, I'm just pinpointing some things. I'm taking the liberty of picking those things that will help me with my points. So in the uh, 60s in the U.S., a lot of things were going on as a result of the Great Society and um, what uh, was called then a war on poverty, which was a great idea. I don't think we, um, we may have won some skirmishes, but then the enemy came back, I think, in some ways. But Head Start is one of those wonderful programs that still exists and continues to exist. It was based in part on child development research at that time. And that's the point I want to make. And it was also moral obligation to serve children, all children, well. So the two points there, the moral obligation and the fact that research was involved. Its audience at that time was mostly those who work in those environments working with children and their families. So um, trying to have a thing here of what the justification was for some of these things and the audience. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965 was uh, an outgrowth of that first uh, response to Sputnik called the National Defense Education Act. Um, I always laugh at the notion of in 1958 we connected the defense of the country militarily to education in the name of that act. Well, we softened that up just a tad with ESEA. Again, there there was an oral, moral obligation because there were a lot of programs in service to deal with the needs of people who were economically disadvantaged. But we also had then the economic and political competitiveness with the idea of uh, carrying on the Cold War with the Soviet Union. It too had sociological research backing it to some extent, particularly the Coleman Report. It led us through the misinterpretation of Coleman's work to some bad policies at the ground afterwards, but that was not Coleman's intention. And so uh, people haven't mentioned him for a long period of time, but now it's being focused on again. So there's a lesson in terms of how we communicate our research what, when others pick it up because they may misunderstand what we're trying to do. And well, I'm characteristically staying up here. In um, the 1960s in England, which was a different environment for me to be in, and uh, it's a contrastive environment, we were uh, starting in the U.S. to see what they were doing as an inspiration for elementary education. In 1965, the Cloudman Report was released in um, England to guide elementary education. And there was this dramatic notion of responding to practitioner knowledge as well as the moral and philosophical obligation to meet the needs of children. Um, I'm always amazed to note that it was a elementary decision to go with what we call progressive education. How amazing that was. You heard the tense of that word. But uh, it did spur on 20 years of wonderful practice in England, and I was fortunate enough to study a great deal of that. <coughs> I can't see too well. Um, in the 70s, we had the Education for All Handicapped Children Act. That was uh, uh, PL 94-142. Many of you know that very well. It set off our response to the needs of children who, were <coughs> who are handicapped and have disabilities. We call them handicapped men. And uh, better for you can see the moral obligation to serve all children. There was also then at that point a response to the political activism of the families of those children, and not the least of whom included the Kennedys, who always uh, promoted the notion of meeting the needs of people with disabilities because of their, only family, oh, their own family connections. Then we jumped to the 80s. Things took a different turn. 1983, a nation at risk, still the starting point for current policy in education. If you ever look at that document, and we have six copies in the library, I have checked those six out repeatedly to take to classes. There is absolutely no reference to 
to research. There were people interviewed who supposedly knew about research, but they did not cite them. I guess we didn't have any at the time. <laughs> but it was clearly economic issues that were driving it and competitiveness still with the Soviet Union, increasingly with Japan, and whoever is out there who seems to be doing more number one stuff than we are. And that can be, you know, in rankings or whatever. So we go to uh, what was going on in England in the 80s. By 1988, under Margaret Thatcher, the national curriculum had been developed in 12 key curriculum areas. So now we're getting into specifying what needs to be learned in all kinds of areas. Passed by Parliament yet again, but not supportive of progressive education. It was designed to remedy the perceived failures of progressive education, and it came out of contrary philosophical and moral position. Again, though, no reference to research. But the economy was referenced, and competitiveness, and to be fair, England was at that time going through a very serious recession. The audience now, with the nation at risk and through some of these remaining things, was not only the practitioners, as in telling practitioners what to do and how to do it, but also the public, to please the public that we were doing something about the perceived disaster called public schooling. So that was an audience to make them feel better about what we're doing. 